Good morning, Bethany. It really is an honor to be here. Um, my colleagues and I are so glad and so thankful for your warm hospitality. As you've heard, Bethany's had a very long history with World Relief, and so this first of its kind reverse ministry trip is a really important evolution of our partnership together, and we're so glad to be here. Um, as we say in Rwanda, Murakozi means thank you. Uh, so my name is Lanre. My husband and I are originally from Nigeria, and for the last 13 years, we've made our home in Northern Virginia. Uh, but I grew up uh, in a Muslim majority country uh, next to Nigeria in West Africa, and that was where I spent most of my childhood from second grade to ninth grade. I was, that was where I came to faith. And so the people um, and the culture of Africa, and particularly West Africa, really holds a special place um, in my heart. And that's what I want to talk to you all about today, uh, my heart, your heart, um, and contending for hope. Um, I don't know about you, but I look at the news, I look at the world around me, and it feels like it can be very broken, and it can be hard to find uh, the pockets of hope and the, the ways of hope. Um, so that's what I want to talk about today, and you'll see in your bulletin we're going to be talking about four postures of the heart on our way to uh, maybe returning to hope. So you can follow along there. Uh, but before we do that, I want to show you a photograph. Uh, there it is on the screen. Um, I love this photograph. When I saw it a few years ago, my breath kind of caught, and I was like, oh, yeah. This feels like home. This feels like family. Um, I was very blessed to have kind of an idyllic childhood. I have two loving parents who are watching me. Hi, mom and dad. <laughs> um, but this picture really evokes um, safety and love and delight and comfort. You know, you have this big um, man, stately and regal in all of his finery. He could be an imposing kind of presence, but there's a gentleness um, about him as well. The photographer uh, didn't name this picture, uh, but I call it my Baba picture. Uh, Baba is the word for father in my language, uh, Yoruba. And uh, the picture was taken in 1948 um, in the West African country of Mali uh, by a photographer named Seydou Keita. And so you see here this man, he's imposing, and then this chubby little girl sitting on his lap, curled up in his arms, and even though this man is really big, she is not afraid. It is clear that she delights in being with him, and there's mutual joy in this relationship. Um, and I look at this picture. I have it up in my office. I look at it several times a day because this, for me, I want it to be the picture of my relationship with God. I want this to be the image that comes to mind and the posture that I would take uh, when I am in the presence of my father. And so I want you all to keep this image in your mind as we kind of look um, at, this, at this passage that we're going to talk about, because it represents hope. I think it represents hope and delight and joy. Let's pray. Daddy God, thank you um, for who you are and for the way that you are with us. You are so kind and you are gracious. So God, I pray that as we come um, to you, the text and to the word this morning, that you would speak a fresh word to us. Help us, Father, to be fully present, that we may hear from you, and that we may learn and be encouraged in your word. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So um, a few years ago, I was in a very dark place um, in my life. I'll spare you the details, but you can fill in this story with any hard thing that you've had um, to deal with. And I was curled up on my couch in the midst of a massive pity party. Um, and my husband called in reinforcements <laughs> and asked my girlfriend to come uh, and sit with me. And she is a wise woman and a woman of few words, so she didn't say very much as she sat with me. Um, in my grief, but as she was leaving, she gave me Psalm 27, 13. And the translation that I read that day said, I would have fainted if I had not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
And that was an anchor for me in that moment. I needed those words. And so I grabbed onto it and I said, yes. If David, in the midst of what he is going through, can have this confidence and say, I have hope, I have confidence, I will see goodness while I am alive. It was a balm to my soul. And armed with that, I felt like that little girl in Baba's lap, right? Like my daddy is big and he can take care of everything and I'm going to be okay. Um, And for a season, that worked. I don't know about you, but I can complicate things really quickly. Um, And in the work that we do in World Relief, we see a lot of vulnerability. We see a lot of hard things. We are upfront with many ways that the world is broken and is hurting. So it can be hard to hang on to hope and started to kind of look at David and all his hopefulness with a little bit of suspicion. Like, what what is this really about? How does David arrive at this place of hope? How is that possible? You know, for me, when life gets thorny, I start to doubt God's goodness. I doubt his intentions towards me. I doubt his power to bring about good for me or in the world in general. And so how is it that David is able to come to this? So I said, let's go back to scripture. Let's look, look back at what, what it is that David is saying in the psalm. And as I studied, I've learned that uh, sometimes you have to read a psalm kind of from the inside out, um, that the way that the Hebrew poem is kind of set up, if you read of the inside, it helps to put the beginning and the end maybe in better context. And so when you look at Psalm 27, you know, David comes out of the gate super confident. God is my light. He's my salvation. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to fear. He gets to the end of the psalm and he says, I'm confident, I have hope. How is it that this happens? So we go into into the psalm. Uh, David starts out by saying something that I don't say when I'm in the midst of hopelessness. He says, hey God, can I hang out with you all day? Uh, We look at verse four and David says, "Um, God, one thing I desire that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Note that heart posture. This isn't David kind of barging into the house and saying, I want to talk to the manager. I want a word with whoever's in charge. No, David is, is, is saying, hey God, can I hang out with you? Can I be here? This isn't um, the posture of um, a worker or an angry, angry client. This is the word of a child, a child that believes that they have standing here that says, hey, daddy, can I hang out with you? Can I stay here? Can I be in your presence? And we know that uh, David isn't just talking about a physical place. Yes, at this time, there was a physical tabernacle. There was a tent and a courtyard where priests went and offered sacrifices. This is before the temple was built. But David already has this sense that God is not limited to that physical space, right? And so David is saying, if I hold you in my mind, if I I keep my mind focused on you throughout the day, will you stay with me? If I try to keep you front and center in everything that I'm doing, will you accompany me? That's the first heart posture, dwell. The second heart posture on the way to hope is praise. So if you know anything about David, he was a worshiper, um, he was a poet, he was a musician, he was a dancer. David often gave kind of outwardly expression um, of his adoration of God regularly. He knew that praise is something that God loves and that worship draws our hearts closer to God Um, In an earlier psalm, David says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Um, Abigail mentioned that. Um, David understood that there's something about where people are adoring and that they're worshiping God, uh, that he loves that. And so in Psalm 27, um, in verse 6, David says, Then my head will be exalted. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and I will make music to the Lord. 
David is essentially saying, when God gives me the gift of his presence, when he allows me to hide in him, I will respond in praise. Now we know that when David is writing all of this, all of his life problems have not been solved. He's writing this in anticipation, in faith. Think back to that little girl, um, has no sense of what the future is, but is safe and secure and beaming in the joy of being with this Baba. So can we be the same? Can we find it in our hearts when things are difficult, when we're clawing our way back to hope? Can we pause to praise God for who he is and for what he is doing? It's the second heart posture. The third one, um, in verse eight, David says something that I found interesting. It says, my heart says of you, seek the Lord, seek his face. And he says, your face, Lord, I will seek. But hasn't David been seeking God this whole time? He's asked to dwell with God. He's been praising God. So how is he still hearing this insistence to seek God maybe in a different way? Another translation says, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, O Lord, I will seek your face. Whichever way you read it, essentially there's this call and response. Something or someone is calling David to search for God in a different kind of way. I think of it as like this Baba is playing hide and seek with his little girl. You know, he goes off somewhere and he says, come, come child, come find me. And knowing full well that he hasn't capriciously gone to hide himself somewhere unfindable, the little girl scurries off. Okay, I'm going to come look for you. I'm going to come find you. Now, the illustration isn't perfect. Thankfully, God isn't playing hide and seek with us. Um, a lot of times, we're the ones that have lost sight of him, and he's there calling us and saying, come find me. I'm right here. And so David turns his heart and he says, yes, God, I will seek you. David says, do not hide your face from me. Don't turn away from me in anger. He's saying, let me look at your face. Let me see the kindness there. Let me see the love that you have for me in your face and in your gaze. So this is the third way that David positions himself and postures his heart on his road to hope and confidence. And then the final heart posture that David describes is in verse 11. And he says, teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a straight path. So it seems here that David is saying, I have positioned myself to be with you all the time. I have given expression to your greatness in a place of praise. I have obeyed your invitation to look for you and to seek your face. And now I want to learn from you. Teach me. Instruct me in the way that I should go and how to order my life. David understands that without direction and wisdom from God that he's lost to figure out how to outmaneuver his enemies and what to do next. He knows that he needs guidance from God. And so this is the fourth hard posture, a willingness to learn and to be taught. In the picture, you can imagine that the little girl um, is glad to mimic and learn from Baba, right? That she would learn to, to walk and to talk and to read and to write from him. We know that in time, she will exercise her independence and not want that guidance. But at the time that this picture is taken, at least, she's probably uh, happy to have that direction and that guidance. So question to us, are we also teachable? Are we willing to learn um, what God has to teach us? And so we come to the end of the psalm again. David has journeyed through the four heart postures and he has arrived at hope. He has stayed and he has tarried with God. He has praised and he has adored God. He has sought God's face and he has learned um, from God, humbled himself to be taught of God. And because of God's gracious response in each of these movements, David arrives at his declaration, I am confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
Now there's some of you that have journeyed with me through these four heart postures and you arrive at a place of hope and assurance. Um, maybe you're confident and you're ready to go out to brunch or whatever the Seattle uh, tradition is after church. But there might be some of you who are thinking to yourselves, really? On top of everything else that I'm dealing with, this woman is standing up here and telling me to take four heart postures that frankly feel impossible. I hear you. And God welcomes your honesty um, in this moment as well. And I have good news. The good news is that this psalm doesn't end in verse um, 13. There's one more verse. And in it, David says something. He says, wait. Wait. Take heart and wait. And so the good news that supersedes everything that we've talked about today is that Baba God himself is coming. He has come once already to reconcile us to himself, to allow us to crawl into his lap with all that safety and security, and he's coming again to finally set things right. He's coming to wipe away every tear, to restore everything that is broken, to heal every disease. He's going to take care of it all. Our rescuer is coming again. So whether you are able to dwell or praise or seek or learn, I pray that you would at least be able to wait. At the very end of the Bible in Revelations 22, 20, Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon. So may we be able to respond like John did um, to that. And John said, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Baba God, amen. Thank you that you have not left us without hope. Thank you that you are willing to walk with us um, wherever we are um, in this moment. God, if we are contending for hope, I pray that you would walk alongside and be so near. And God, if we already have arrived at a place of much hope, help us to be agents of your hope to those that are around us. And thank you that you are coming to set everything right. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.